Alleluia. 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 I would like to just kind of draw our eyes to the folder here. We are in the middle of celebrating a, a series that is titled The Hidden God. Do you see that picture there? The Hidden God. Seems maybe a strange name for a, a series, for a meditation for us. But think about this for a minute. Can you see God? Yeah. Can you see God? Huh? Can you see him? Tesla, can you see God? No, right? Um, instead, God does not make himself known to us. It seems, anyways, right? Think for a minute the story of Moses bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. When Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, how did God do that? There were all of these plagues, right? Many plagues. There was darkness. There was locusts. There was rivers turning to blood. There were frogs. There was the death of all the firstborn. Do you remember these stories? And then when Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, how did God lead them? There was a pillar of smoke, a pillar of fire by night. Hmm? Moses would strike a rock and water would come out of that rock. For many uh, years, God provided food for all of the Israelites from manna from heaven and, and uh, uh, birds from the sky to feed them. God did all of these things. And you can imagine if you were Moses at this time, finally on top of Mount Sinai, God spoke to Moses on top of Mount Sinai, gave him the Ten Commandments. There was these earthquakes and lightning all of this to make God's presence known, everything that God had done for his children of Israel. And at this time, Moses speaks to God while he is at the top of that mountain. And he says to God, you know, you have, you have shown how much you love us, how much you are our God, the God of Israel, by all of these signs and wonders that you have done for us. Now, finally, God, after all of this, this close relationship that we now have with each other, after all of this, Will you show yourself to me? Will you show me your glory? And do you remember how God responded? I will not show you my glory, for anyone who sees my face will die. No one, no sinful human, can be in the presence of God and live. Why is that the case? Why, cannot, why can we not be in the presence of God? What is the difference between us and God? God is holy. Are you holy? Are you holy? Are you perfect? Are you like God? No. And so God being all powerful, God being all holy, all great, if we were to be in his presence, we would be destroyed. So God cannot make himself known to us directly. But he has made himself known to us in many different other ways. How else has God made himself known to us? How did he make himself known to the Israelites? By those plagues, by the pillar of fire, by the pillar of smoke, by feeding them in the wilderness. God makes himself known to us when we look at the created world around us. The psalmist says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the works of his hands. And so when you are spending time out in the hills or out in the rivers fishing and you see the created world around you, that reminds you that there is a great and powerful God behind that. Hmm? God makes himself known to us in our consciences. When you do something wrong, when you do something that you know you should not do, what does your conscience within you tell you? It tells you you are doing something wrong, that you have broken God's law. And so God makes himself known to us in his conscience. God in the Old Testament made himself known to all of his prophets by speaking to them. And the prophets would then speak to God's people. And so God made himself known through his word. But for us, God has made himself known in a way that is far greater than any other way. God has made himself known in Jesus. Jesus said to his disciples, if you are looking at me, you are looking at the Father. To know Jesus is to know God. To see the face of Jesus is to see the face of God. 
And that is the lesson that Nathaniel will learn today. And so our series, The Hidden God, is all about how God has made himself known through Jesus, how the hidden God has revealed himself to you and me through the very real, very historical, very tangible and human Jesus. And here is the hidden God revealing himself to Nathaniel. Listen to how he does this. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, another one of the disciples, he said to Philip, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then added, I tell you the truth. You shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the gospel of our Lord. So uh, when I was growing up, if I ever wanted something, if I wanted a toy or if I wanted a video game or if I wanted that or this, I would tell my parents, I want this. And their response was always, put it on your Christmas list. Put it on your birthday list. And so they never would maybe buy me things directly, but they would say, put it on your Christmas list. Hope that you would get it for Christmas. And so when Christmas would come around, we would exchange our lists with each other in our family. And this was supposed to help you know how you were to buy things for your family members. And so for years and years and years, I would ask my parents, can I have this, can I have that? And they would say, put it on your Christmas list. And every Christmas, I would never get anything on my Christmas list, at least from my mom. She would never get me anything in my Christmas list. And even when we grew up, when I was 18, 19, 20, 25 years old, we would still exchange these lists, and my mom would still never get me anything on my Christmas list. To this day, I am 36 years old. I have never gotten anything from my mother from my Christmas list. And she knows what's on my Christmas list. She would say point blank to me, I know what you want. I know what's on your Christmas list. But I also know what you need, a lemon zester. And so she would buy me things for the kitchen like this type of contraption here. And I would, of course, unwrap it, and I would look at it, and I would say to myself, I do not need this. I do not need this. Um, but interestingly enough, you can use this for a variety of different things. In fact, my favorite dish in the world is what's called lemon pasta. And you can only make lemon pasta if you have a lemon zester. And in fact, my children, Soren, who's six, uh, my daughter, Simone, who's two, their favorite dish is lemon pasta, and you can only make it if you have a lemon zester. And so every time my parents come, they live in Hong Kong, every time they come and visit us here, she picks up the lemon zester, my mother, which she bought for me for Christmas, and she makes us lemon pasta. It looks like something you don't need, but I have been converted, I now believe every kitchen ought to have one of these, uh, that you need one of those things. That might seem kind of trivial, right? But I can remember other times when there were things that I wanted and people would get me not the things that I wanted, but things that I needed. I remember my grandparents growing up, they never got me toys, they would never get me clothes, they would never get me money like I would want. Instead, every year, 
for Christmas, they would send me an envelope, and there was one sentence in that envelope. What I wanted is I wanted a BB gun, I wanted comic books, I wanted money to buy video games, but I never got those things. And our culture that we live in, this Western North American culture where there is so much business and so much money, we become very quickly in tune with our wants. Businesses, commercials, so much of our culture reminds us so often of the things that we want. In fact, so many parts of business today are dedicated towards things like customer service, customer satisfaction, customer guarantees, whole divisions of companies designed to remind us of what we want and to meet the things that we want. So many different things like that. And before us in our gospel, we have a man that knows what he wants. Nathaniel loved the Old Testament. And he would read in the Old Testament about how that Old Testament promised that God was going to send a Messiah. And what he thought that meant is that God was going to send a great conqueror, a great leader, a great liberator, just like the kings in the Old Testament, just like the great prophets in the Old Testament that would lead God's people. God was going to send another one of these great victors like a David or a Samson or a Joshua to come save his people. That is what Nathaniel wanted. And then all of a sudden, Nathaniel's friend, Philip, shows up and he says to Nathaniel, Nathaniel, the one that you've been waiting for, this, this person that Moses and the prophets and that the whole, whole, the whole Old Testament has been talking about, he's here. And Nathaniel's ears perk up. And he says, he's here, hmm? the great conqueror and liberator and warrior that God has promised he's here. Tell me, Philip, who is this? And Philip says, it's Jesus of Nazareth. You know, the carpenter's son from that backwoods, uneducated, poor town of Nazareth. And Philip pauses, and there's a quiet. And he says, you're telling me that the great warrior and conqueror and liberator that God has sent has come from that tiny, puny town of Nazareth, that he is the simple son of a carpenter. Nothing good could come from that. Take a hike, Philip. Nathaniel knew exactly what he wanted. Do we know what we want out of a God? Do we know what kind of God that we would like? What kind of a hero we think God should send to us? If I were to ask you for a list of heroes, what would that list look like? Maybe you would think up fictitious heroes from literature, maybe things like, well, in classical European uh, mythology, Achilles, Hercules, these great warriors, great strong warriors, maybe Batman, like a modern superhero, you would want some type of great warrior, or maybe think of a historical military leader or historical figures and fighters, maybe like a Muhammad Ali, or a Bruce Lee, someone with power and strength, or maybe a great political leader of some sort, Julius Caesar, a Napoleon, a Shaka Zulu, a Churchill, some type of great warrior that would be able to lead great people into battle. Is that the type of hero that you are picturing? And then you list up and you line up this great hall of heroes, and at the end, you would say, Jesus of Nazareth. Does he fit into that lineup? Does he fit into our minds the type of person that we would picture to be a great hero? Not the Jesus that I have in mind. <laughs> Quite frankly, I look at Jesus, and he's just some man that's hanging there on a cross. He died a miserable death. He came from nothing. He seemed, to the rest of the eyes of the world, to end as nothing. This is the hero that God is sending for you and me? But looks can be deceiving. If we rewind again, and we think about Nathaniel and about looks being deceiving. When my grandparents sent me that envelope, it was not the BB gun that I wanted. 
it was not the money or the comic books that I wanted. Instead, I would open that envelope and there'd be a card with one sentence, $100 towards your college fund. $100 towards your college fund. And every year, it would come in. And thanks to that, you have an educated pastor because of my grandparents giving me not what I wanted, but what I needed. Nathaniel knew what he wanted his Savior to look like. He had been praying about it. He had been thinking about it. He had been meditating about what he wanted his Savior, his Messiah, his great warrior to look at. Jesus even said to him, Nathaniel, I saw you when you were sitting under that fig tree. I saw you thinking about me and meditating about me and picturing me. I know your heart, Nathaniel. I know your mind. I know what you want, Nathaniel, but I also know what you need. And Nathaniel did not need a leader or a warrior or a conqueror that looked like a leader or a warrior or a conqueror. What he needed was this Jesus of Nazareth from the back hills, uneducated, poor area of Jerusalem. That's who he needed. He needed a Messiah, a hero, but not the kind that he wanted. And what do we need? What kind of a hero would we like? The fact of the matter is, is that a Bruce Lee, a Muhammad Ali, a Batman, a Justin Trudeau, you name it, whatever kind of human figure you could come up with, they could not help you at all in your greatest need. Because the problems that we are facing is not at heart, the greatest issue is not political, it is not physical, but it is spiritual. When tragedy strikes our community, when death strikes, what we need is a hero, a God that could give us real hope, real salvation, a real future in the face of death. And that is exactly what we have in Jesus of Nazareth. Bible describes us as enslaved not to physical bondage, not to spiritual, or not to political bondage, but to a spiritual bondage. That our sins, our imperfections, have separated us from God. That is why he cannot show his face to us. Because our sins separate us from him. And so what we need is a hero that can break us free from that bondage. And when he conquered sin, death, and the devil, when he broke us free out of the prisons that sin has given to us, it didn't look like it necessarily. But that's exactly what happened on that cross. When we look at that cross, our physical eyes don't see a hero. We don't see what we want. But looks can be deceiving. What the Bible teaches us is that hidden behind that cross hidden behind that defeat and that symbol of defeat is a great victory. Hidden behind a man of weakness is the strength of God. Hidden behind Jesus' cry of pain is a cry of triumph. Because on that cross, God promised that Jesus was taking on himself the wrath for all sins including the sins of you and me, so that we might have a future with God, so that we might truly be saved in a way that no other human being could save us. Because of Jesus, every sin is forgiven, even the sins of demanding a savior or a hero on our own terms, even the sins of being ashamed of a God that is not impressive or heroic in the eyes of the world that is not a leader or a warrior or a conqueror as the rest of the world sees them. All of those sins are forgiven because looks can be deceiving. What looks like to the world, just remember what's hidden behind that cross. The reason your sins are forgiven is because hidden behind it is a man that is every inch a warrior, a conqueror, and your victor. A time came when I could see clearly, when I could understand what my grandparents were doing for me. That when I read that card, 
I could see with my own eyes, finally, that God has given me everything that I needed or that my grandparents were giving everything that I needed for my future. And a time came for Nathaniel and his eyes were open. He said, can anything good come from Nazareth? And just a few verses later, he meets Jesus. He sees Jesus with his own eyes. Jesus speaks to him. And the heart of Nathanael is transformed, utterly transformed. He calls this Jesus his God. And Jesus says to Nathanael, you think you've seen great things now. A time is coming when you will see heaven open. When you will see angels descending from heaven. And that did happen. Of course, not to the world's eyes, but to the eyes of faith. Did you remember when the heavens opened up? When God bridged the gap between us and heaven. It's called Good Friday. It's called Jesus dying on Calvary. And for every other eye that looks at that cross, it looked as if a man was just simply dying a normal death. But to our eyes, through the eyes of faith, through that faith that God had created in the hearts of Nathaniel and the rest of the disciples, when he explained clearly to them what was happening on that Good Friday, was a man dying, stretched between humanity and God, stretched between earth and heaven, Jesus opening up the way for you and I to enter heaven and eternal life. That hidden behind this death, was God literally opening up heaven for you and I to rescue us from our sins. And it happened to you too, just like to Nathaniel, your eyes were opened when you came into connection with Jesus, with the very words of God. A spark of faith was created in your heart so that you can see Jesus for who he is. You see him, just as the rest of your church family, as your warrior, as your leader, as your conqueror. He is the hero that you need. He has saved you from eternal damnation. He gives you hope for a future. He promises that all things he is working out for your good. A child that he loves. He is a victor. He is worth worshiping. He is worth calling our Lord. Amen. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God that transcends all understanding, that peace that is yours, because through God's word you have learned who your hero, your warrior is, may dwell in your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.